away from fossil fuels far more radical than anything the IPCC proposes. The second point is that to have a real discussion about the transition away from fossil fuels, it's essential to understand the way that these fuels are consumed. Most fossil fuels are not consumed by individuals, they're consumed by big technological systems, urban transport systems, urban built environments, electricity <coughs> supply systems, systems of industrial agriculture. These systems have developed in the way they have because of the social and economic systems in which they're embedded, predominantly capitalism. So take the example of urban transport, the problem is not just people driving big cars fueled by internal combustion engines, it is that since the 1920s in the USA and since the Second World War in other rich countries, cities have been shaped around cars. Private profiteering by manufacturers has been supported by public investment in roads and parking spaces at the expense of other types of transport. It's been supplemented by urban sprawl. And technological innovation has focused on making bigger and flashier cars, not on good ways of people getting from place to place. So to stop using fossil fuels, the whole way that we move around in cities, indeed the whole way we live in cities, has to change. We need to think about cities that are free of privately owned cars and free of the rush hour. The idea that we can decarbonize urban transport with electric vehicles is an illusion. And it's very good to see the Labour for a Green New Deal saying that. But some people in the Labour Party are a million miles away from recognizing the scale of change needed. In South East London, where I live, we've been campaigning to stop the mayor investing a billion pounds in the Silvertown Tunnel, which will run alongside the Blackwood yeah. Tunnel, and ensure that the number of cars on the roads increases. When we met with Heidi Alexander, the Deputy Mayor for Transport, she claimed that the tunnel is compatible with the bold decarbonisation strategy, which it is not. Some local councillors have said that the new tunnel will, quote, reduce greenhouse gas emissions overall. That, to put it politely, is post-truth politics. <laughs> Third point. The way that technology is developed is dependent on the social and economic context. So we cannot depend on clever technology to solve problems that are made by capitalism. We need to think of it the other way around. To supersede, we need to supersede capitalism in order to release the potential of good technologies. So taking the example of electricity, at the end of the 19th century, socialists across the whole political spectrum that that word implied thought that electricity would be a powerful force for equality and for cooperative ways of living, and they agreed to it with optimism. But what we've seen in the course of the 20th century is that in the hands of governments and corporations, electricity on the one hand did become a force that transformed millions of people's lives for the better, but at the same time acted as an instrument of exploitation and division. The deepest division, of course, being between those with access to electricity and those without. And today, more than half of Africans have no electricity. And this includes most people in Nigeria, where the local energy economy relies heavily on biomass collected by women and children walking miles daily to collect firewood from forests. While a greater amount of energy content than the total used in Nigeria is shipped out of the country as oil for international markets. Now today, claims are made that the internet of robots and new types of automation will be the basis for human liberation. But in the hands of corporations and governments, they are being and will be turned against human interests. I think another danger is to believe that as the cost of new technologies falls, the market will enable them to easily push out old technologies. The Labour Party policy document on electricity, bringing energy home, relies heavily on such a scenario to enable community-owned renewables to outcompete the big six energy companies. Such an approach runs a danger of underestimating our enemies. To achieve an integrated system that provides electricity and home heating and services, not marketable commodities, a more aggressive strategy is needed. If that means state ownership of electricity generation assets, which is not currently in the Labour Party policy, then that policy should be adopted regardless of which powerful union leaders are offended. The fourth and last point is that the conclusion is that a transition away from fossil fuels requires a drastic disruption not only of technological systems but of the social and economic systems. In the labour movement, in which I'm a lifelong participant, to envisage realistically how to achieve these aims, we need to confront old myths. We need to expose the false reactionary argument that tackling climate endangers jobs. 
This nonsense is used to justify the third runway in Heathrow, for which more than half the parliamentary Labour Party voted last year. We need to break from the idea that economic growth under capitalism, endlessly feeding, endless consumerism, is somehow good for workers. That dogma prevents us from elaborating truly bold socialist visions for the future that change the social and economic systems in such a way as we can start to use the technologies of humanity and not for profit. So, thank you, Simon. Uh, our next contributor is uh, Dr. Jason Hinkle, uh, who's an act academic, a writer, and more importantly, an actress. Uh, he's based at Goldsmiths University, he's one of the people who helped uh, shape Labour's international development strategy, the wealth of the many and not the few, and he's the author of The Divine, which is, again, an absolutely brilliant book, which everybody should read. Uh, Jason, I'm plugging everybody's books today. Go on, Jason. Um, okay, so I'm going to make a brief intervention um, with just three key points to make uh, about what a Green New Deal needs to look like. Um, so, of course, I think at this point it's kind of it's widely accepted that we need a Green New Deal. The, the left is clearly behind this, you know, and everything that entails mass mobilization, you know, sort of planning for an energy transition, uh, you know, state investment in doing so, etc. But if we want our Green New Deal to be technically feasible, ecologically coherent and socially just, that it needs to be a Green New Deal without growth. And that's what I'm going to argue briefly in three points. The first point is this, that growth makes the clean energy transition uh, almost, well, in fact, impossible to achieve. And the reason is because growth is a compound function, right? And so um, economic activity increases exponentially. Uh, and of course, this drives energy demand up at the same time. So effectively, we're, trying, we're expanding energy demand at the same time that we're trying to transition um, our energy system over to renewables. So it's kind of madness, like fighting unnecessarily an uphill battle. It makes our task much more difficult. Uh, and this is, this is exactly why we're presently failing. Despite enormous new capacity development in renewable energies, uh, growth is, dri is driving energy demand up beyond the level we can supply in terms of renewable energy. So you can think about it this way. Um, at our present rate of global economic growth, which is about 3% per year, then we'll be doubling our, our, um, our, com our economic activity every 20 years or so, right? So by the middle of the century, exactly during the time frame that we're supposed to completely decarbonize to zero, we'll have nearly tripled the size of our economy, right? So it's difficult enough to transition our existing economy over to renewables in this extremely short period of time. It's impossible to do so three times over during this period of time, right? So the IPCC itself, the, inter the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has indicated that it's not feasible tra to transition to renewable energy fast enough to stay under the 1.5 or 2 degrees carbon budgets, while at the same time growing the economy at, normal, at existing normal rates. Uh, the second point is that even if we could transition um, fast enough, if we keep growing the economy, we'll need to keep growing clean energy production as well. Right? And clean energy production is not, in fact, clean because we, this requires ever more solar panels, ever more wind turbines, ever more batteries, ever more electric vehicles, etc., uh, which is an enormous increase in material uh, extraction, uh, production, transportation, um, etc., of metals and rare earth minerals. Right? With, with devastating ecological effects, we, are, you know, we know that mining is, is already the, one of the major drivers of biodiversity collapse um, and deforestation, as well as a negative social impact, right? Um, particularly in the global south, if you think about already what lithium mining is doing to people in the Andes and what uh, coal tan mining is doing to people in the Congo. That's going to increase as we grow our energy demand uh, in clean energy. So we absolutely do need clean energy, yes, uh, but if we want our transition to clean energy to be socially just, we have to reduce total energy demand. Okay. And the third point is this, and that's that the ecological crisis that we face is not only about emissions, even though climate change is obviously the dominant uh, part of the conversation right now, we also we also face a crisis of soil depletion, deforestation, uh, you know, ocean dead zones, and mass species extinction. Uh, and these are not just side threats; these are central existential threats as well. Uh, and all of this is being caused not just by our energy system, but rather by our material production and consumption. Okay. So, on a per capita basis in Britain right now, um, uh, we consume about four times more materials per year. Uh, than is ecologically sustainable on a global level. 
So if the entire world were, were to consume at the rate that we consume materi uh, materials, then we would need four planets to sustain us. Okay. So switching to clean energy is not going to reverse these trends. Uh, one can imagine an economy powered entirely by clean energy, um, but what will we use that energy for becomes the question. To keep fueling the juggernaut of ever-expanding uh, production and consumption of waste, we'll keep chewing through our, our living planet. And that's unacceptable from an ecological perspective. So if we want our, our Green New Deal to be ecologically co uh, coherent, we have to reduce material throughput. Okay. So the solution here basically is that we need to prioritize the, uh, the reduction of energy demands. Okay. So the, the less energy we consume, the easier it is for us to accomplish a, a rapid renewable transition, even within the time frame of 2025. Okay. Um, to do that, what do we do? We have to, uh, um, you know, we can, uh, we can legislate for longer uh, warranties on products. So we, we, we double or triple the average lifespan of things like washing machines and cars and, uh, and iPhones, etc. We can introduce a right to repair so we can easily get our gadgets fixed on, uh, on the street corner without having to buy new ones every, every two or three years. We can ban the practice of high levels of lessons. We can eliminate food waste as South Korea has already um, taken steps towards doing. We can liberate public spaces from advertising, which create this unnecessary psychological pressure for us to consume, making us unhappy in the process. We can shift from models of, of private ownership to models of public usership, right? Um, and we can actively and democratically decide to scale down specifically ecologically destructive industries um, that are also socially unnecessary. We can have a conversation about that, okay? Um, none of this will have a negative impact on people's quality of life. It will, let's admit, lead to a reduction of aggregate economic activity, uh, but that's okay. And I think that as a labor movement, we need to understand that that's okay, um, as my colleague points out earlier. Um, to deal with potential losses in, in unemployment from this uh, course of action, we can uh, shorten the working week, redistribute necessary labor with a job guarantee, make sure people have uh, uh, you know, high wages to compensate for hourly losses with a, a national living wage law, uh, law, et cetera, et cetera. So all of this is effectively redistribute existing income in the economy to make sure that we can improve people's lives even while aggregate economic activity uh, declines to make a, um, a radical and rapid climate transition possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. 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 Thank you nicely and seamlessly on from that uh, about material use. Uh, we have uh, Hal Rhodes, who is the Head of Communications at the Guy Foundation, which works a lot with frontline communities. He's a coordinator in the Northern European uh, section of Yes to Life, No to Mining, uh, which is a global solidarity network, and he works a lot on extractivism. And I'm sure he's going to push the report, but I, I will also push the report that we've just published together with London Mining Network on this very issue about material use, a justice transition is a post-extractive transition. Uh, how? Thanks, Azza, and thanks very much for having me. Um, I just said to Jason, it's made my job really easy because all the macro factors have now been much more beautifully explained than I could put them, but um, as I said, said, we've been working on this report together, um, which really looks to sort of put flesh on the bone of exactly why the just transition must be post-extractive. Uh, what we need to look to reduce that material demand, overall energy demand, overall. Um, and as Jason has spoken at, at that macro level perspective, I'm going to focus more on the community perspective and also the ecological perspective of making the case for that. And also how the mining industry, um, which these days is no beach friend, especially in the global south, um, is, is trying to capitalise on, on the, the endless growth of renewable energy technologies and other things. Um, so again, I would also restate that we are obviously all 100% invested in that renewable energy future, one that's socially just and ecologically viable, but at the moment, even our most progressive proposals for that transition are based on a reorganization of extractivism uh, away from fossil fuels and towards another suite of minerals and metals, um, rather than transformation away from extractivism. And, and that's significant because extractivism is a massive systemic extraction of non-renewable resources um, from with a massive ecological and social cost, um, exacerbating inequalities that have been handed down and, and perpetuated over the generations, um, stemming from colonialism, uh, neo-colonialism, and those groups. If, if you can 
economics that Jason was talking about. Um, and those costs uh, are obviously concentrated mostly in the south and in some of the north's more um, look, um, left behind peripheries. Um, the mining industry is uh, on the move on this, and they've been working for several years to position themselves as a deliverer of the renewable transition, especially around six key minerals and metals cobalt, copper, lithium, manganese, nickel, and zinc. Um, and they've been bringing lots of nice new terms into play, for example, climate smart mining, responsible mining, sustainable mining, green metals, clean metals, all with a, a view to inserting themselves into the climate discussion. It's a business opportunity for them, and that's what we fundamentally understand. Um, because the demand and the projected demand for these critical minerals is skyrocketing. But the reality is that it's all guff. Uh, only a fraction of that increase is actually from what could be considered a socially just renewable energy demand. A uh, vast majority of it's from the digitalization of the people, heavy industry, from the military and other uh, massively destructive areas of our economy. Um, and that renewable energy doesn't account for the majority of the projected demand at all. If the mining is up, if mining industry is allowed to place itself as the deliverer of the of this transition to renewable energy, you won't achieve it because of the, well, and here's why. <coughs> it's important to say that it's capital intense, labour poor, expansively destructive mining that we're talking about, um, largely mark oriented and focused in the south and the north per north peripheries, and that. This increase in extraction is massive. So we're looking at from a 2011 baseline, 150% increase in metal extraction, 135% uh, increase in mineral extraction. Um, and the, the results we can expect from this, and the trends that are already emerging, which we're seeing as observers of the mining industry and people campaigning against them, is that mining already accounts for 20% of global climate emissions, according to the uh, study this year by the UN uh, Environment Programme. Um, it's unraveling the resilience of climate critical ecosystems through direct destruction. Obviously, we all rely on those for our well being. It's pushing to new frontiers like ours and in the deep sea, obviously, very vital for our climate functioning. Um, it's expanding and it's disrupting this because the ore grades of these things are declining. So, you have to essentially remove more living ecosystem, expand that destruction, displace more communities in order to access the same amount of minerals and metals. And there's a multiplier effect here because Geopolitically, the US, the EU, and others are positioning themselves to have their own access as energy security concerns shift from fossil fuels to these minerals and metals. And so we're going to see, and we are seeing mines emerging in parts of the world uh, where, they, where they historically haven't had to deal with this in order to have that ease of access and incredibly aggressive trade strategy um, being implemented to try and get these secure minerals and metals from other um, more insecure territories. Socially speaking, the Business and Human Rights Review Centre revealed that most renewable energy companies are linked with human rights and critical mineral supply chains. And to quote from that, 87% of the 23 largest companies mining six minerals essential to the energy transition have faced allegations of abuse, including land rights infringements, corruption, violence, or death over the past 10 years. Just a far cry from what the industry is saying about how it's cleaning up its act to deliver the renewable energy transition. Um, mining is there's over 590 uh, documented cases uh, of, of conflict, and 34 people were killed last year in these uh, in these um, these conflicts. So, what's the solutions? Um, Jason's mentioned many of them, but in this report, we're also talking about how communities themselves, frontline communities, are bringing forward those uh, those solutions. And the S Live Motor Mining Network has developed a series of emblematic cases of how the seed forms of post extraction emerging from the community level. So connecting this back with where we are today with esteemed colleagues on talking about a Green New Deal, um, my question for everybody in view in particular is how can an internationalist Green New Deal being put forward here champion and, and embed a politics of consent that centers the lives and rights of communities on the front lines of extractive struggles uh, and supports the post-extractive spaces, processes and rights that they're asserting under massive pressure from the states and others that they're embedded within. Thank you. And um, moving on, of course, it's not simply about you know the material use or the extraction of new green metals and, and mineral. As we've said, it's also about who owns energy and who owns the new so-called green energy technologies. 
So our next speaker and participant is Raya Alsano, who works for Who Profits, which is a research center uh, exposing the role of the private corporation in the Israeli occupation economy. She's the author of a, a new report called Greenwashing Golan, the Israeli wind energy industry in occupied Syria and Golan. myself and Autumn, we produce things collectively as an organization, um, and we have a number of reports on the Israeli green energy industry, be it from wind farms and the Golan Heights, but also solar energy um, and electricity being produced primarily on occupied and colonized, um, and colonized land. Um, and in a sense, I guess, the whole green energy or green electricity production um, the Israeli green electricity production comes within a much broader framework of Israeli settler colonialism and occupation. Um, and I know it's a bit of a contentious point to make here in the UK at these times that Israel is a settler colonial project, but it is. Um, and it does that and it makes profit out of it. And it, at the moment, it is kind of developing uh, green kind of has a, its plan, its green plan and its green strategy. Uh, is primarily based, and it comes from its um, its occupation of Palestinian and, and Syrian land as well. And if you see the map, it's a little bit, uh, it's not very clear, but it has concentrated its solar fields in two uh, regions. One in the Naqab, so the southern part of the state of Palestine, and the other part is in the occupied uh, West Bank in the Jordan, um, in the Jordan, in the Jordan Valley. These Areas are have a high exposure to sun, so they're very good for producing solar, uh, solar generating electricity. But they're also home to the most impoverished, the most precarious uh, Palestinian communities, be it citizens of the Israeli state or people that are under the direct occupation of of, uh, of Israeli uh, of Israeli occupation. And and you see that electricity is being produced on land, but the people of the land are those that live around it and very close to it have no access to that electricity that is being generated in the same in the same space. And Israel started producing or erecting constructing these fields in 2002 in the Naqab. It has the biggest solar field or strives to develop its current solar fields to become the biggest in the region. And it very much uses it as a way to kind of gain a legit kind of gain legitimacy within the, the conceptions or the struggles of how we fight for a greener and a better and a better and a better world. So in a sense, it's greenwashing. It's a violations of Palestinian of Palestinian rights. And I think there for us the question of is green always green and is it always positive? And I think people have talked about it of why it's not necessarily always positive from different directions, but from our perspective, it certainly isn't progressive and positive from our own kind of uh, perspective of who is producing the electricity. Um, Israel also produces the electricity, but it has a monopoly over the, over the selling of electricity. So not only is um, occupied land and the population uh, being controlled and the elect green electricity is being produced on, uh, on, at their expense, but also Palestinians have to buy electricity from Israel. There's no possibility for Palestinians, even if they wanted to, to produce kind of cleaner electricity. So they have to buy it, and Israel sells it to Palestinians at a price that is 1.2 more expensive than it sells to its own uh, to its own population. So it kind of adds layers and layers of, of oppression and repression that we need to be um, that we need to be thinking about. And the same is, is relevant for communities in the Golan. The Golan is a Syrian, is Syrian land that is occupied also by Israel. And there they've developed wind, wind farms. And the story is, is, is the same. Um, and so this, in a way, is kind of where, where we're at in terms of looking at the, green, at the green energy and how Israel uses it for its own benefit and its own, and its own regards. And of course, this is only possible with the help and support of, of private capital uh, and international companies that, again, position themselves as leaders as leaders towards a progressive world, but in fact we see that they're deeply complicit 
um, in oppression of communities in Palestine. And I'm sure the story is not only a Palestinian specific story, but it's a much more of a, of a global one. So we've always known that energy and extraction of fossil fuels and control of fossil fuels and minerals and metals have been part and parcel of the imperial project. You can go back to the rationale as to why colonization happened, uh, why what India's what the UK's role in India, etc. was. Uh, and of course it continues to play a role as we can see. Our next participant uh, is Dr. David Waring, who's a, a teaching fellow at the International on, um, at, on International Relations at Royal Holloway, sorry. Um, he's an expert on our relationship of the UK with Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, and will speak very much to the imperialism of our energy uh, economy. Should have asked for a book club, shouldn't I? Everyone else gets a book club. And you're right. It's a very recent class. So, Fossil fuel production has always had a sort of major um, role in British foreign relations, always, at least through the 20th century, mid 20th century up to now, so the last 60 or 70 years. Um, if you go back to this sort of historic exploitation of fossil fuels, oil in particular in the Middle East, under the auspices of British imperial rule in the Gulf and elsewhere, it's part of how we build social democracy. You know, it's unfortunate to say all fans of the Ahly government up to a point, but how do we get an NHS? How do we get a reconstruction after World War II? Partly through exploiting the oil resources of the Middle East at a price that was far lower than what they had the right to expect for it. Um, um, leading corporations, BP and Shell, got ripped off of all of that. BP used to be the Anglo Iranian oil company. And really, our entire um, strategic posture in the Middle East, increasingly like the key strategic area for British foreign relations in the last 60 70 years, if you boil it down, it's basically about oil and gas and the wealth generated from its sales. So there's a long history to all of this. Coming up to now, um, fossil fuel producers in the Middle East are amongst the leading uh, purchasers of British arms. Um, about 50% of British arms now go to Saudi Arabia and the mine in particular. <coughs> and <coughs> excuse me, the wealth generated by the sale of oil and gas by those fossil fuels fuel producers, called petrodollars, not only helps to maintain our arms industry, but also is funneled into the, into the city, a large amount of um, large oil investment into the city of London. So oil and gas has been, and in various ways continues to be, a major strategic value to, to British power, British power internationally. So the underlines get that a bit more, the kind of underlying problems here. Number one, the British state made a strategic commitment after World War II, it sees the empire is going to fall away, but it makes a strategic commitment to maintain its status as a global power and to base that largely on its militarism. To be a global military power, you need your own arms industry. You have to rely on other people to provide you with your military capacity. If you're going to have your own arms industry, that's going to cost money. If you're going to tax the population, piss them off, make them start to think maybe we shouldn't have an arms industry, or you can start to are you going to sustain it financially also through revenue gen you generate from arms exports? And that's what the British are trying to do. Maintain that domestic arms industry that they need to be a global military power, partly through arms exports. All the other arms export markets in the world are basically shrinking apart from the Gulf, where all those petrodollars are, which they use to buy our, our weapons, our really complex weapon system, um, like the jets that are pulverizing Yemen at the moment. So all these things are connected. Saying so the weapons that they use to crush their own populations when they rise up calling for democracy, again, purchases petrodollars from our arms industry. So all these things are, are connected. One of the underlying problems, therefore, is British commitment to being a global military power. Another one is British neoliberalism in the sense that when you shift from the emphasis on manufacturing exports towards the emphasis on financial services, one of the symptoms of that is a trade deficit opens up, deficit in your current account. How do you sustain the value of your currency when you've got a deficit in your current account? Through financial inflows from abroad. And where are you going to get that capital? You get it from a bunch of different places, but one of them is sovereign wealth. The gold is one of the leading sources of sovereign wealth in the world. It's well, um, sort of comparable to hedge funds in terms of the sheer amount of money that we're talking about. Trillions. Um, Saudi Arabia, on its own, last time I checked, anyway, contributed 
20% net global capital inflows into the city of London. It's astonishing. Um, sustaining British neoliberalism in part relies on the inflow of fossil fuel, of, um, of the dollars. And that's coming not just from economic, war economic decisions, pure economic decisions that the Saudis are making. They're also making this decision, we send that, those petrodollars to the British and also to the Americans, the British and the Americans will help continue to play that role that have been playing for the last 70, 80 years, ensuring our survival. Those things are connected. And that willingness to prop up these machines, even as they, as they did in Bahrain a few years ago, Barclay crushed peace with the democracy movements, willingness to back up those machines, arm them to the team, to the extent that their authoritarianism is our authoritarianism too, their violence is our violence too, as we equip them for means to do all that stuff. That's part of maintaining that political economy of Britain's relationship with those fossil fuel producers, largely due to value of petrodollars. That's all we're going to do about all this. Um, what values should inform our response to, to these facts? And one of them has to be solidarity with people in Yemen, with people in Bahrain, who are suffering as a result of our collusion with the British state's collusion with the elites that are waging war in Yemen, waging oppression in Bahrain, in Egypt, and around the Middle East. Um, another value has to be just to radically rethink the political um, economy of British foreign relations in terms of British neoliberalism, which isn't contained within our borders, British capitalism has always been international, um, and in terms of our commitment to be a global military power. If you love British neoliberalism and you love British, um, British militarism, then you know you're in favour of this relationship. If you don't, this is how it needs to be dismantled. And um, if the oil is going to stay in the ground, those petrodollars are going to dry up, and this whole political economy can't function anymore anyway. So you know, these are how these things are connected. Um, but who can help us change these policies? And how? Um, academics and think tanks can help us develop ideas about how we can transition from how the British arms industry can transition from making arms to um, creation of renewable technologies. If you can develop that as an export industry, you can close your trade deficit, you can close your trade deficit, you'll be able to need for petrodollar inflows into the city of London. You can break that relationship with these authoritarian regimes in the Middle East. Um, the unions can feed their knowledge into those processes of transition from arms to renewables, and activists can bring that pressure on union leaderships where it's needed, it's often needed on the PLP, etc. etc. Um, main recommendations I think we should have, or demands we should have for the Labour leadership. Immediate end of arms sales to fossil fuel producers right now. I'm thinking yeah, about Yemen in particular, but it's played an enabling role in the creation of the world's worst humanitarian catastrophe. That has to end. Number two, transition of arms industry jobs, skills and resources to renewables and other non-military exports. Close that trade deficit, obviously, capital inflows from the Gulf, and to incorporate all of that into a transformative green deal. Thank you very much. Last but not least, is a brief of all who uh, is not only a, a very clever, a talented, and amazing comrade, uh, and one of the co organisers of today's session and quite a lot of the sort of radical green sessions in trying to connect the issues of uh, racial, economic, social and political.